Well, again, it's, it's great to be uh, back here in Gisborne. My last visit was in 2006 on another uh, IT-related uh, project. So what I want to do today is really just share a story, um, a story of um, some of the work we're doing out of Dun Eden's Silicon Valley, which is Mosgill. Um, but it's, it's an incredibly ambitious but also a, a meaningful project in terms of how we're wanting to open up education uh, to provide free service uh, or to provide free learning opportunities to all students worldwide um, by using open education materials. And open education materials are materials which we are free to reuse, adapt, and modify without restriction. And so I want to share aspects of that story and how we are, are able to do this by using uh, copyright smartly. And I think a, num you know, a number of the lessons we are learning through this collaboration internationally are equally applicable in, in the school sector as well. Um, you know, I originally trained as a school teacher myself. So I just want to you know, share that story. Um, and I think the Tech Expo has kind of got the, mes the central message right. Um, and, and that is that the internet can mean the death of distance. Uh, we, we are developing an, a, a, an international collaboration involving uh, institutions, colleges, polytechnics, universities from 25 uh, different countries, for, well, at least from five continents, and we're coordinating this out of Mosgill. Um, so it's, it's amazing what we can do with the technologies we have available today, but at the same time, um, you know, really getting back to the, the virtue of and, and the mission of what education is really about, and that is to share knowledge. So, this is the point where I give my standard health warning, and that is if you do suffer from hypertension, it's best that you listen to me under parental guidance. And the reason for that is I am a free software user, and if during the course of this presentation, I don't get to mention your favorite proprietary software application, uh, take a deep breath, relax, you'll, you'll be just fine. Uh, the deal is if you come to me and say, hey, Wayne, that is really a cool piece of software you're using. Can I get a copy? I don't want to face the ethical dilemma of refusing to help a friend to give the software away in order to uphold the legality of the copyright of the software. So um, this is why I'm a free software user. A little bit about myself, I'm the director at uh, a non-profit organization called the OER Foundation and our, our, our strategic mission is to provide international networking support uh, to education institutions to achieve their strategic objectives using open education approaches. Uh, I also hold the Commonwealth of Learning uh, Chair in Open Education Resources. There are four of these chairs internationally, our network. Uh, there's a chair in, in the Netherlands, a chair in Canada, a chair in Brazil, and uh, a chair in New Zealand. And the significance of UNESCO around all of this is, uh, and the Commonwealth of Learning, is in June 2012, the, uh, the member states of the United Nations got together and adopted something that is called the, you know, the, the Paris Open Educational Resource Declaration. And what this declaration is about is basically that if educational materials are funded by public money, they should be released freely for the benefit of our citizens. And, and, and that that's logical. Uh, I mean, why, why should we have to pay twice for our education materials? Now, the challenge around this, of course, relates to copyright. Because if a teacher creates any education materials, um, those materials do not belong to the teacher. The copyright of those materials belongs to the Board of Trustees. And similarly, with tertiary education institutions, uh, teaching materials produced by our academics actually belong to the employer. So that makes it very hard to actually share our education materials. So we, at the UNESCO Chair Network, are working together internationally uh, to move this agenda forward. At the OER Foundation, we administer two flagship initiatives, uh, the Wiki Educator Project, which today is one of the world's largest collaborations of more than 60,000 educators working at the heart of the education endeavor, and that is to share knowledge freely. All these materials 
are openly licensed um, that are developed. Our other flagship initiative is the OER University, which is coordinated by the OER Tertiary Education Network. Um, and this is a consortium of uh, tertiary education institutions from around the world who are working together to provide free learning opportunities to all students using open education resources. So I'll spend a bit of time talking about that. But I do want to recognize our leading New Zealand pioneers in the network, um, Otago Polytechnic, the University of Canterbury, uh, NMIT, the Open Polytechnic, uh, WinTech, UniTech, and NorthTech, and of course the OER Foundation. And I can, this happened yesterday before I prepared the slide, I can also confirm that Lincoln University has joined this network, uh, this in, network of international partners. So, I mean, it makes sense. If we start sharing, you know, education materials through, open, through OERs, as we call them, together with the open education practices, we will be able to improve quality, reduce cost and widen access to education. And it makes a lot of sense. And the whole reason I joined the teaching profession was to share knowledge. Um, but as I said, there are some interesting barriers, and these barriers relate to copyright. But if you go and ask New Zealand teachers or New Zealand educators what they think about this notion of sharing teaching, and this is based on research we've surveyed over 900 educators worldwide, and I've separated out the data from you know, the, the Kiwi-based educators, and this is both secondary and tertiary. 96% um, of our educators believe uh, the content that is funded from taxpayer dollars should be shared freely, and it should be available for use by everyone. Um, the majority of our teachers, by far the overwhelming majority of our teachers, believe it's fair and reasonable uh, to be able to copy and reproduce you know, mat you know, materials for teaching purposes. Many people say there are numerous barriers to this OER movement, and if you start asking teachers about these perceived barriers, I'm reluctant to share my teaching materials because I don't have time. 88% um, of New Zealand educators say, no, I disagree with that statement. Uh, I'm reluctant to share teaching materials because there are no incentives for me to do it. Well, 88% of New Zealand educators disagree with that statement. I'm reluctant to use o OER because there's no guarantee of the quality. Uh, again, 100% of our educators disagree with that statement uh, because if you cannot discern the quality of the materials you're using, you shouldn't be teaching. So if you look at this, uh, the majority of our educators want to do this, right? But we can't because of copyright. And I want to use an interesting example. And this is a real life example of one of the courses we were developing for the OER University, which is based entirely on open educational resources. And it's a first year course in uh, looking at international relations in Asia and the Pacific. And one of the modules in this course is looking at the question of the history of the region. And for those of you that are well informed of the history of the South Pacific will know of the Lapita people. Uh, they were a seafaring nation, and we've discovered through you know, archaeological findings uh, Lapita pottery, which is carbon dated back to 1100 BC. Now, this is pretty old stuff. Now, what is interesting when you come to the question of copyright, copyright didn't exist until 1709, all right? It didn't exist until then. It was first enacted by the Statute of Anne in England, which basically, well, it was originally enshrined as an act to ensure your rights to cop copy, but you know what, what has happened since then. You may not touch uh, any copyrighted materials until you know, 50 years after the author has died. So we wanted to use this photograph, right? So the actual object, the Lepita pottery, is, should be in the public domain, A, because there wasn't any copyright when it existed, or was first created, right? And, uh, and B, uh, I'm, I'm sure the author or the creator of that thing is long dead. You know, this is 1100 BC. But the problem, of course, in the digital world is that the copyright belongs to the photographer or the employer who employed that photographer to take the photograph. This is a photograph of something that is in the public domain. The copyright of this artifact is owned by one of our leading research universities. I wrote a letter to the copyright officer saying, with this philanthropic organization, would you please relicense this under a Creative Commons attribution license? 
The letter that came back from the copyright office has said, um, sure, you can get the license to use one instance of this on a website if you send us 150 US dollars. I said, no, uh, I know how to resolve this problem. I can get somebody from the open free culture community to come take a photo of that object and release it openly because the copyright will belong to the photographer. Needless to say, I got no answer from the university. But the story has a happy ending. One of our member institutions, the University of the South Pacific, happened to, uh, at, at the time, uh, Professor Nunn, uh, who was the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research at the University of the South Pacific, actually had made one of the most significant archaeological findings of Lapita Pop Pottery at the Burewa excavations. I wrote a note to Peter. I said, hey, Peter, would you mind releasing your uh, photos under an open copyright license so that we can share and learn? So you can see the interesting challenges we are faced with in the digital world around copyright. But we can solve these problems, and we can solve them through the use of Creative Commons licensing. Creative Commons licenses is about giving permissions in advance. You can still refine your copyright by keeping your copyright, um, but in advance provide permissions to be able to reuse copy and adapt those materials through a set of, of licenses. There are six Creative Commons licenses. I'm not going to go into the detail of all those licenses. But if you're interested, I'll give the gift of knowledge. We run regularly free open online courses to learn about all this stuff. Um, and there's a big move in New Zealand for schools to adopt open uh, licensing policies. Uh, we've got 10 New Zealand schools that have already done so. The boards of trustees have adopted open licenses as well as we've got two tertiary education institutions that have open policies, uh, Otago Polytechnic and Lincoln University. So I've got some brochures here. If you want to sign in for this course and learn more about copyright, it's free. We're giving this away for free. And it's a bunch of, it's a lot of fun. You can join educa educators from over 54 different countries who are learning about this stuff. So a little more about the OER University. The central problem we are trying to solve is we know from research at the Commonwealth of Learning and UNESCO that we need to provide for an additional 100 million places in tertiary education in the next 25 years, an additional 100 million places. You can do the mental math around that. That's the same as creating four sizable universities, roughly of the size of the University of Auckland, every week for the next 25 years. And you and I know that that's not going to happen. And so this is the problem we are trying to solve and we are trying to address. We called together a, a meeting in February uh, 2012, uh, 2011. It was, in fact, the day after the Christchurch earthquakes. We had 200 participants from all over the world uh, through the web conference and the folk that met face to face to test this concept of building an OER university. And the concept is basically this. We can build courses that are based entirely on open education resources, which students can access for free. That means not having to spend a cent on any textbook. It is possible through the use of technologies to build in levels of support uh, to support these learners. Learners who want to get form formally assessed towards a credential uh, can do so by um, our member institutions will provide a credentialing service on a fee-for-service basis uh, in terms of uh, step laddering towards credible credentials. This is what we're doing. And you're going to, you know, you're surely going to ask me, you know, Wayne, but how is this going to work? I mean, where's the money coming from and, you know, who's going to pay for this? Well, the logic behind it is quite simple. It's not rocket science. The marginal cost of replicating digital knowledge is near zero. And think about it. If 10 institutions collaborate on developing high-quality OERs or assemble courses from OER, it's far cheaper than doing it alone. So we've got the economics sorted, and we know that there are lots of learners who want to benefit from this. But again, the principles we are using are not that radical. Uh, industry does this a lot, the whole uh, idea of disaggregating services. The traditional university model is one where you can buy all your services as a single package, right? Your content services, your interaction services, assessment, credentialing, support, and technologies, you buy it as a single package. You pay your tuition fee. What we are doing and what OER enables us to do is to disaggregate those services. 
So what the OER, OER Foundation is doing is providing content services and interaction services for learners at no cost. The support and technology related services, we share them across the institutions, they get provided to the learners at no cost. The only cost that the students will need to carry is the cost of what it is to assess that, and that's essentially the academic or the lecturer or the educator's salary for the time they spend on grading the final assessments. The proof is in the pudding. Our first prototype courses at the pricing levels they were priced at, and I've done the comparison. The cost of a four-year degree, the average cost of a four-year degree in the United States of America is just short of 20, uh, 26,000 US dollars in terms of tuition fees that students are paying. Here in New Zealand, if at Otago Polytechnic you wanted to do four years of you know, study, that's going to cost you about 19,000 US dollars, tuition fees. With the OER University model, the cost of that four-year degree, if it's done entirely through the OER University model, will be uh, you know, 6,700 6, US dollars. That is roughly about you know, 20 percent uh, of what the costs would be in the US. So, it's a smart model. No new money is required. This from the institutional perspective. No new money is required. Our institutions have a way of recouping their recurrent cost. This is low cost, low risk, but high impact innovation and how we can use open education resources to widen access to tertiary education. The OER University is shifting the question from how do you achieve sustainable OER projects to how your institutions are going to remain sustainable without OER. We are the competition, we are doing this. The OER University will provide free learning opportunities to all students worldwide. And as Jim Taylor, Emeritus Professor Jim Taylor from the University of Southern Queensland says, it's not theoretical speculation. We are doing it. My closing slide, and uh, if you'll forgive me, I'd like to paraphrase Edmund Burke. All that is necessary for, for the closed and unsustainable education systems to triumph is for good organizations to do nothing. Thank you kindly for your attention.